Coming up on this week's edition of NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. You'll meet a Colorado family that's committed to improving the health and well-being of their animals. Plus, see how NRCS is helping Maryland cattle producers protect the environment. And now, NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. We begin with comments from three of NCBA's producer leaders who participated in a Cattlemen's Call podcast, answering questions about the impact and issues for the cattle industry as the coronavirus pandemic continues. One area of focus was government assistance to cattle producers. This is something that's relatively new for the livestock industry to be involved in this kind of a, uh, assistance from the government. But we have so many people that are hurting uh, uh, there's some losses that have occurred, and so I think there's more of a willingness to at least be a part of it. And I think NCBA was instrumental in uh, making certain that livestock got included this time, particularly cattle got included in, in this uh, latest round of assistance. And uh, while there will be other industries that will share in some of that money, the livestock and cattle industry will certainly be able to get a part of it. And uh, I think generally it's probably more favorable, uh, you know, more people in favor of participating than there are that are opposed. I think the kind of the summary is there's a time to be proud and then there's a time to be smart. And when your family's hurting and the bills are piling up and you have red, red ink flowing, this is a time to be smart. And we appreciate NCBA stepping to the plate, securing these funds to help us get through. And it's not going to make us whole, but sometimes it's the little bit that ekes you by that gets you to play the game again and that's what's so important and I think a lot of appreciation to securing that money for our ranchers and farmers. Also in the podcast the producer leaders answered those who question NCBA's relationship with Packers. Certainly that is something that we hear and I think this is a good example of where NCBA has stood up for all beef producers. We did engage in some rather pointed and heated discussions with the Packers we saw some response to that, and we'll keep working that. We are working for all producers, cow-calf segment, feeder segment. That's what we are about. And again, the programs we're talking about in Washington are directed towards producers, not toward packers. Anybody that says that, I'd ask them to come to our meetings. Uh, they'll see very quickly when they look at our board of directors, when they look at our executive committee, they look at our officers. You're not going to find any packers in the mix. That's not... Uh, that's not who makes these decisions. This is the decisions and the directions at NCBA are made by the grassroots members from all over the country. I, I know this is going to come as a surprise to many, but everything you read on Facebook isn't true. And I think this is, a, this is a prime example of when you talk about fake news, it just keeps getting regenerated and regenerated with no substantial background to it at all. This is a perfect example. So... From my perspective, nothing could be further from the truth. If you look at the history of NCBA, and I mean a long history, policies never come from the Packers to be implemented by NCBA. They always come through producer or producer groups. So nothing could be further from the truth. However, that doesn't mean we don't have relationships with the Packers. And I think maybe that's where the breakdown occurs. It's important that we have relationships with the Packers and know who to talk to and make sure that when things get a little sticky and we need to make sure their processing plants can continue to operate when we need them to operate, we have those conversations and make sure we're doing all we can do in the defense of producers to make sure that their product is getting processed through. Well, certainly I think the biggest thing is just to remember that we are all in this together. This affects every individual throughout this country and throughout the world. And we need to remember the human side of this. That's the, that's the most important part of it for everybody. Let's remember that we are all in this together. Let's keep working together to, uh, to bring this to an end and protect ourselves, protect our families, and let's get along together. The full Cattlemen's Call podcast is available to all. Go to the website ncba.org to listen and subscribe. Hello and welcome to NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. I'm Kevin Auctioner. The National Cattlemen's Beef Association works every day to advance the economic, political, and social interests of the U.S. cattle business. 
and to be an advocate for the cattle industry's policy positions and economic interests. We had a chance to ask attendees at the recent cattle industry convention and NCBA trade show why they value the organization. I'm an NCBA member because I feel that this organization does an outstanding job of representing all facets of the industry and actually as a cow-calf producer I think they do a very good job of, of representing cow-calf producers. Um, their, their approach to on the state level, on the government level, on the federation side with the checkoff, uh, the people that work for NCBA are just are outstanding and, and they do a very a very thorough and a very articulate job of representing our industry. I'm an NCBA member because it's the best organization in the country, in this world, to help protect us, our beef, and, and what we are, and who we are, and how we're going to do this industry and, and sell it to the people and the general public. I like to put my money where my mouth is, and I feel that by putting together funds, all of us as a group, it gives us a powerful, powerful base that we can operate from. I'm an NCBA member because of what this outfit does for all cattlemen. Uh, it's one of the probably premier uh, kind of membership organizations that I belong to because I believe they, they give me the, the value for the dollar. I'm an NCBA member because I think it's important for us to have a voice uh, as you know a commodity production group. We are producing a food product that is pretty detached from our end consumers, and I think NCBA helps us uh, speak in a coherent voice and tell people why beef is good here and around the world. I am an NCBA member because of the, what they do in Washington, D.C. to benefit me as a cattle producer down the road. It's just, I can't be there every day, and Wall, South Dakota is a long ways from, from D.C., and um, they're, they're, I pick up the phone and I can talk to somebody and find out what's going on. I'm an NCBA member uh, to represent my own interests, you know, from, from an individual, um, you know, associating with, with other people, uh, going out so that we can get together and, and uh, have a voice. NCBA is a grassroots organization led by producers who volunteer their time and effort to ensure the beef business remains strong and sustainable. Here to share some insights on what it's like to be a volunteer leader is Don Schiefelbein. Don, tell us a little bit about your family's operation there in Minnesota. Yeah, well, we got a large family operation. There's eight brothers and myself, dad and mom, and now four nephews back on the operation. So. We got a huge family operation trying to make a living in the registered seed stock business. We also feed some cattle and we actually own part of a sale barn. Outstanding. And you know, you and I have bumped into each other at a lot of meetings and a lot of organizations over the last 20 or 25 years. You volunteered an extraordinary part of your time, amount of time, in lots of, of, of cattle industry organizations. Why do you do that? Well, I think the family wants me away, but I'm not, I'm, I'm not certain about that. But the bottom line is, I believe we live by the credo, so as the industry owes, so does your own operation. And so if you want this industry to be successful, I think it's paramount that you give time and effort to try and do the things that make the industry successful. And I think, you know, it goes down to that bottom line question. Somebody's got to do it. Right. And I guess given our family structure and the number of family members at home, I've been fortunate to have the ability to have the time to do it. The world is run by those who show up, is it, that right? It certainly is, it yeah. certainly is. And you have uh, volunteered your time to a very important committee, the uh, Policy Committee. You served as chair. Uh, tell our viewers just a little bit about how policy is formed within NCBA. Well, at NCBA, it's all grassroots. So the, the policy basically percolate, percolates up from those at the grassroots membership. Mm -hmm. So they kind of get together, decide from a state affiliate standpoint what needs to be done or what needs changes need to be made. They go through their affiliate, put the policy together, okay. submit it on to our nationals, and then it gets adopted through a grassroots vote. Gotcha. So it really does come from the bottom up, not calling it all down. Is that yeah, right? that, that's exactly right. Yeah. It is grassroots. And, and again, our, we live by that policy book. So if the policy says this is what we agreed to, 
we are obligated to carry out those actions. So if you want something done or want something changed, it's done through the grassroots level. So I want to ask you a very direct question. I've read a lot in the press and from some, some people who say that uh, NCBA is uh, run or, or controlled by the packers and that in fact that there shouldn't be a packing processing uh, involvement in a cattle industry organization. What do you say to that criticism? Well, you know, I'm a, the policy chairman, right? Right. And to this day, I haven't a packer call and tell me what we ought to be doing. I've had many, many producers tell me what to do. So it's important they're part of the process, but by gosh, the majority of the influence is cow-calf producers as it should be, mm -hmm. and that's precisely what's occurring. So I think we're in good hands. Very good. Thank you so much for all the leadership you provided our, our industry. We greatly appreciate that. Thank you, Kevin. Now, if you'd like to stay up to date on all the key issues and events from D.C., one way is by becoming a member of NCBA. Members receive the Beltway Beef Newsletter. That's a weekly report straight from our capital that gives an up-to-date summary of top policy initiatives that will impact your business. Joining is easy. Just call 1-866-233-3872 or you can visit the website ncba.org. Still to come on NCBA's Cattleman to Cattleman, we'll introduce you to a Colorado family that's committed to raising happy, healthy cattle. That story when we return. Stay with us. It's an unspoken rule that cattle come first at the Flying Diamond Ranch in East Central Colorado. That's because the Johnson family knows the success of their business depends on the health of their herd. We've got a look at this multi-generational operation where the well-being of the animals is the top priority. Ranching, kind of at its most simple, is turning free resources, sunlight, and a little moisture into grass. And then grass into beef. That, to me, is the ultimate symbiosis of nature and animals and man. It all has to work together, and we have to really work at understanding and caring for the land. We're a commercial operation. We take a lot of pride in that. We make our living from our cattle on our ground. The misconception out there is to be a business operation, you have to, you know, either exploit the environment or ignore the environment, but we've found the exact opposite. We found what's best for the environment is financially what's best for us. We want the sunlight and what little rainfall we get to provide all of the tools necessary to turn grass into beef. Our grazing philosophy is to mimic the environment these prairies and this grassland has developed over for millennials. Back in the day, the buffalo were in tight, tight clusters. You can imagine 500,000 head buffalo really tightly compact. When they hit new grass, it'd take an hour for the herd to pass through. So when they left, it was very heavily grazed. But then the key to that is they would migrate so they wouldn't be back to the same place for a year or six months or stuff. So there was intensive grazing, but then long recovery. That's how the prairies of North America evolved.
So to mimic that, what we do is these temporary fences to really concentrate our herd into small areas. Get a lot of hoofs breaking up the soil cap, getting their manure and urine in a concentrated area, hitting it really hard. But then through temporary fencing and whatnot, uh, we can keep them off that for a long time and get that necessary uh, recovery period. This fence line really demonstrates where the cattle have been and where they haven't been, and you can really see the herd impact that has happened. We have worked really hard to set up a pretty intensive rotational grazing system that is kind of like a Rubik's Cube to think about and put together correctly um, so that the cattle are moving through our prairie in a way that gives any one spot of grass rest, you know, 95% of the time. Our prairie out in Eastern Colorado at headquarters where we've been for 100 plus years, that's all native prairie rangeland. What that means is that all of the moisture comes from rain. We don't have any irrigation to supplement rainfall. So we have implemented in that arid prairie grazing practices that really help revitalize our soil using the cow as that tool. In Westcliff, the Flying Diamond Ranch recently expanded here last year. And we have a lot of irrigation because we have mountain water. Here we move our herds daily, so we move them quite a bit. Hey girls, Let's hey go. girls, let's go. <laughs> new pasture, new pasture. <laughs> Most ranchers, what they'll do is they'll take native range, plow it up, reseed it with a monoculture hay, harvest it, and then feed that to their cows during the winter. We're taking the approach of removing machinery from the land here and replacing that with nature's best harvester, the cow. In the next couple of years, there won't be hopefully a monoculture of just hay. More plant species will be here because the cattle will be turning up the soil, urine, manure, and then just natural seed pollen from native range around will turn that hay ground back into native range. We can get a lot more grass production off of acres and uh, run more cattle on the same amount of land, and that has a lot of benefits for the natural resource, the land itself. It lets us run more cattle with the same amount of overheads, labor, grass, pickups, and all that. Yeah, we're pretty happy with the results we've had thus far. I think we are doing something really positive, really congruent with you know, what is this land? What has it historically been? What is it historically supported? And I think grazing cattle is what is sustainable in our environment. Animals existed and thrived before human interaction. And we have found that if you take care of your animals in a way that nature took care of them, you kind of remove yourself, let the cattle behave naturally, see how that benefits them, how that benefits the environment that they graze upon. Come on, ladies. And you know, it all just kind of works together. It's pretty humbling to see that happen. That story was brought to you by Beringer Ingelheim who's proud to feature a ranch that embodies the company's cattle first philosophy. You can see the entire documentary at cattlefirstmovie.com. Up next on Cattleman to Cattleman, see how John Deere equipment is helping a pair of Missouri producers put up their hay more efficiently. Stay with us. We'll be right back.
what does it mean to be dependable? It means you do what you say you'll do time and time again. Because performance isn't optional, and your task is essential. For over 95 years, we have proven ourselves to be the most dependable choice. That's why the cattlemen of this great nation trust Ritchie to provide fresh water on demand. Ritchie, proud to be a partner to the American cattlemen since 1921. It's often a no-win situation. The hay is ready to cut, perhaps pass ready, but there's a chance of rain over the next few days. So, do you cut and risk the crop getting wet, or do you hold off and watch the quality decline as it stands in the field? Cattleman to Cattleman reporter Brian Baxter shows us how John Deere machinery is helping some Missouri operations get their hay cut and put up more efficiently. Jack Harrison of Kingdom City, Missouri has plenty to do to keep him busy. In addition to owning and operating a sale barn and backgrounding cattle, he also has his own cow-calf operation. We keep 900 cows, about half spring and about half fall herd. We stick with crossbreeding, we take our black cows, we breed them to Horn Hereford bulls. All our baldy cows, we breed them to straight Angus bulls, try to get some growth and production out of them. Off to the west, closer to Columbia, is where you'll find Grant Farms, which used to be a diversified row crop and cow-calf operation, until owner David Grant decided to make a change and focus all his efforts on the cattle. We're converting our row crop acres that we own to forage. Uh, we're going to set up a, a rotational grazing system and, and some strip grazing setups. and. So we're in the process of converting row crop ground to that operation, so. Cows are mostly crossbred. We've got some red Angus. We've got some uh, Angus cross cows, mostly using same Angus bulls, some red Angus bulls as well. Jack and David know high quality hay is essential to the success of their operations, but a lot of factors can impact production. One of the biggest is weather. Both of these producers recently dealt with an unseasonably cool and wet spring which put all of their field work, including haying, behind schedule. We were getting rains a lot in the spring, and just like everybody trying to get their crops planted, it, it we you know probably had hay that didn't get put up at the prime time. We've run out of hay the last two years in a row, so we've took on a, more hay than we ever have this year because we wanted to build our supply back up. Timing is everything when it comes to cutting hay, and farmers and ranchers need to work quickly and efficiently when Mother Nature gives them a window of opportunity. That's why Jack worked with his local John Deere dealer to purchase a W260 self-propelled windrower for cutting. His limiting factor in his production of his hay was, uh, was mowing. He simply could not get enough acres mowed down in a day that he could bale. So he came in and, and you know, we, we talk quite a bit and see each other and, and that was always his complaint. He did purchase it and he's been happy so far all year. He's got his hay put up, uh, you know, probably quicker than he ever had. And one of the things that one roar led to is he found out he had plenty of hay down and then he couldn't maybe bale it or he could bale more if he had a second baler. So he did decide later in the year um, to add a second baler to his operation. Our problem always was getting enough hay down in a day with the cell barn I've got and everything else I've got, I'm on a pretty tight window. We got this machine and three weeks later we bought another baler. It, there's two balers cannot stay ahead of this machine. It's got V10 steel rollers in it and we have noticed that it, it, it took our drying time. Oh, it cut off at least 24 hours of having to wait on hay drying. Uh, th this machine has got us where you can set the speed on your rollers and, and it's pretty amazing. I mean, you can slow it way down where it just barely sets the hay on the ground or you can fluff a windrow up and turn it up full blast. It'll fluff it up that high off the ground or that air will get underneath it. The W200 series wind rowers feature a fully integrated auto track steering system. This increased accuracy and control allows for faster operating speeds. No matter how good we are when we're driving it ourselves, you buy a 16 foot head and you only use probably 14 feet of it. Um, now he's getting the full efficiency of that machine and the full 16 foot width. We set up what, we, what do you call adaptive curve mode. Once you make a track all the way around the field, the next track it'll follow and you'll see a curve coming up here. It, it, it follows all the curves in the field 
with me doing absolutely nothing. You heard that little beep? That means, well, you're probably within 50 yards of getting to the end of the row. So it kind of lets you know, and especially in this 25 foot tall Sudan, it's pretty nice because you have no idea where you're at. I'm on the phone pretty much nonstop. Need to be watching the Marcus nonstop. So now with this auto track, I've got it set up. I'm going across the field and I can uh, just put in my phone and I can even watch real-time livestock markets going on as we're going across the field and I really get hooked up into it. I can even buy cattle right over my phone while I'm mowing, mowing that pay down. As for David, he puts a high priority on both speed and reliability when he chooses his hay machines, which is why he believes in the value of using a disc mower conditioner to cut his crop. Well, I've got an 835 John Deere MoCo. I mean, it's just been a great machine. It's a center pivot, so we can mow a few rounds around the field and then just mow straight back and forth. And, and I really like that feature. And, and uh, it's an impeller machine. In other words, a conditioner instead of rollers, it's got impellers. And I think that does help on grass hay, especially on curing time. One of the key features of the John Deere mower conditioner is the cutter bar. John Deere's got a very durable cutter bar. Uh, what it is, it's a sections cutter bar, so if you were to happen to hit, you know, a steel post or a big rock out there, it not only has a shear hub to protect that section of the cutter bar, if need be, if you have to go into that cutter bar, you can take one section out of it out to where a lot of the competitors, you have to take the complete cutter bar and break it into half. Both David and Jack use a John Deere 560M when it's time to bale their hay. This is my fifth John Deere baler. Probably the best thing about that I find with them is I think they have less moving parts than some of the competitors. Um, I love the mega wide pickup. It's aggressive, you rarely plug it. Um, the push bar on the pickup that holds the hay kind of down and flattens it. And, and uh, the net loading is very friendly. I mean, anybody can do it. It's, it's very simple. A John Deere baler is hungry and it, it, it'll eat all the hay you can feed it. You got a good round bale that comes out of the back of it that's tight, that sheds water and uh, makes storage key. For cattle and hay producers like Jack and David, the service and parts availability from John Deere is a critical advantage. I look to John Deere equipment because, you know, of the reliability of the machines. Uh, knew other people that had them and, uh, and we've got a good dealer, good dealer support. You know, they, uh, they take good care of us, so that's very important to me. You know, at the end of the day, it, it takes a team to, to feed the world, and that's what we're here for. We're here to support the people that are actually growing the grains or producing the livestock that are here to feed the world. Every day, these operations experience firsthand how great service and dependable equipment helps lead to success in the beef industry. Reporting from Missouri, I'm Brian Baxter for NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. If you'd like to learn more about how hay equipment from John Deere can bring value to your farm or ranch, visit your local dealership or check out the website johndeere.com. Still to come, we'll show you how the NRCS is helping a Maryland cattle operation protect and improve its land and water resources. We'll be right back. We didn't just design the 6M tractors with you in mind. We designed them with you by our side. The new 6M tractors from John Deere. Reimagined by you, for you. With improved visibility, better maneuverability, and more ways to customize. So you get everything you need and nothing you don't. Experience the new 6M at your local John Deere dealer. Join the National Cattlemen's Beef Association. NCBA is the oldest cattle industry organization, working every day to defend your interests in Washington, D.C. And there are big benefits to being a member. You'll get news you can use in the National Cattlemen and policy updates from Beltway Beef, plus big discounts from John Deere, Cabela's, and more great partners. Join now. Call 866-233-3872 or sign up online at ncba.org. For years, the USDA's Natural Resources Conservation Service, otherwise known as NRCS, 
has helped cattle producers improve their land and resources. Cattleman to Cattleman reporter Matt Fleck shows us how NRCS is working with operations in Maryland to improve their production while protecting nearby watersheds. Hedge Apple Farm in Maryland was first established in 1731. Today it operates as a purebred Angus cattle operation owned by the Jorgensen Family Foundation. The goal of the foundation, driven by the vision of the Jorgensen family, has been to not just have open space or just to have a farm for the sake of having a farm, but to have a family business enterprise that's profitable and then as a result sustainable. Just a few miles away sits Calico Farm, a cow-calf operation started in 1994. B.J. Sweeney recently handed down the farm to his son Brian, who handles the day-to-day -day operations. So we're a family operation. This is a family farm. Uh, I'm a second generation. My dad purchased it uh, 25 years ago. Conservation is extremely important to us. This is our land. We plan on being here for generations to come. One concern these operations share is how their livestock impacts the water sources in and around their property. Any runoff from their farms eventually makes its way to the Chesapeake Bay, and both want to do everything they can to protect this vital waterway. This farm, for as beautiful as it is, has a, a mile of frontage on the Monocacy River. The Monocacy River is a major tributary that runs into the Potomac River and from there right into the Chesapeake Bay. We were worried and concerned with the excess of nutrients that were finding their way from our fields and our operation directly into the water, which leads to the Potomac and eventually the Chesapeake Bay and causes environmental problems there. Both farms enlisted the help of USDA's Natural Resources Conservation Service for technical expertise and conservation planning. Since 1935, NRCS has worked with private landowners and managers to protect and enhance their natural resources. So NRCS is the federal agency uh, that works with farmers and ranchers and forest owners across the country providing the financial and technical resources to help them put conservation practices on the ground. We have about 10,000 employees across the country, across almost 3,000 district field offices. We really have no bounds for what type of farm we can work with, regardless of animals, regardless of size. Um, I really think truly that we have the ability to help anyone regardless of their situation because of the unique amount of practices that we can offer and the unique type of practices that we can offer. NRCS visited both farms to identify the opportunities and resource concerns each operation faced. Then the agency created conservation plans unique to each operation and provided hands-on assistance when it was time to implement those practices. So the beginning process of this is really when we come out and evaluate the farm, uh, we are going to design a conservation plan that really addresses all of the resources on the farm, um, that really meets the farmer's needs, and then really addresses the resource concerns we're after. All the conservation projects that we've been doing for the last few years, NRCS designed, um, that includes the buildings, the watering system, uh, the drinkers, uh, NRCS came in and they designed the entire thing. Well, NRCS has been amazing to us. Any questions we have, any problems that come up, we can go to them and ask what options are out there to improve it and what we can do and how we can do it. And uh, they'll come out here and talk with us and see what we can do to, to make the operation work better and more efficient. They bring a set of expertise that we don't have in land use planning, in manure management, even in animal management so that uh, Working together, being able to bounce ideas off one another, being able to have the expertise and design of something like our winter feeding facility uh, is just a tremendous asset. Both operations appreciate not only the technical support they've received from NRCS, but also the cost sharing to help put those plans into practice. The value of NRCS is uh, it's helped us uh, accomplish uh, all those uh, con conservation uh, uh, activities and programs that uh, we have accomplished and they've been able to allow us to do it more rapidly than we would otherwise have been able to do it. It's very important for producers if they um, have questions or they think they have environmental concerns they can stop in and visit one of their local NRCS offices. Our staff would be more than happy to sit down, come out to the farm, visit firsthand, identify those concerns and start looking at uh, a plan 
that can help address them. And, and usually those plans involve some type of cost share funding that we can offer to help them uh, be more successful. At both Hedge Apple Farm and Calico Farm, the land and the cattle are healthy and thriving. With those kinds of results, the value of focused conservation planning with help from NRCS is clear. So the conservation efforts that we've employed through the help of the Natural Resource Conservation Service here on this farm are part and parcel to the sustainability of this farming operation. Could we have done it alone? Absolutely. Would we have done it as quickly and as thoroughly as we have? No, probably not. Right now it's a work in progress, so we're constantly changing and adapting to different problems that arise. And uh, the conservation plan just gives us somebody who can relay what other farmers in the area are doing and how they handle certain aspects of their operation. My encouragement to farmers is that good conservation really makes good financial sense. It's, it's the right thing to do, but it also really has a positive impact on the bottom line. I promise you that we have great staff that are willing to sit down and, and work with the producers hand in hand, try to teach them and educate them along the way, um, and really look at ways they can improve their operations. Reporting from Maryland, I'm Matt Fleck for NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. Now, if you have conservation practices you'd like to put in place on your operation, you should start by visiting with your local NRCS office about the technical and financial assistance they can provide. Go to the website nrcs.usda.gov to find an office near you. Still to come on Cattlemen to Cattlemen, you'll learn about a great company that offers year-round solutions for nutrition and herd health. That story when we return. Grass is the center of our universe. So everything revolves around that. We've got to have a grass program that we can count on and plan on. What we need is an effective herbicide that can kill the weeds. That's what we need to sustain us, to keep us growing, to keep us prospering. We grow our own cows. We like selling them, not buying them. I'm Tommy Brandenberger, and along with my wife, we're cow-calf producers. It started with a man, a plot of land, and a few head of cattle. That man, your great-grandfather. You've got his name and his legacy, too. It's what you fight to live up to and work to leave behind. With innovation, integrity, and passion that runs as deep as yours, we'll be there for your operation, for your future, for you. This is why Merck Animal Health works. Well, with us is Chris Hagedorn with ADM. And Chris, thank you for joining us here on Cattlemen to Cattlemen today as we talk about your company, ADM. You know, it's always been a commodity company itself, but certainly here of late, we've seen a lot of buzz in the feed additive and compound feed space lately. For our viewers at home, explain to us why the increased focus these days on enhanced nutritional programs. Sure, Russell, thanks for spending some time with us today. You know, ADM has been a well-known commodity company, uh, providing a lot of co-products to the uh, cattle industry. And we know that there's additional nutrition that needs to be brought into the programs when we talk about those co-products. And so ADM's transitioning and really focusing on the value-added nutrition that we can bring through trace mineral supplementation, vitamin supplementation, and, and phytogenics. I was going to say, that was my next question. Explain for folks at home what phytogenics are, a little bit about what is that and what does it mean to your customers? Sure. So phytogenics are, are botanicals. They're natural extracts that we pull out of plants that have some value uh, to the biology of the animal. So we start talking about uh, ginseng in the human side. Well, we have garlic compounds. We have capsicum compounds that actually provide value to the cattle in combating different stresses that they may experience. 
and Chris continuing on, I want you to now look into your crystal ball a little bit for us, uh, not just here at your trade show booth, but also for folks at home. What do you think we'll be seeing in the beef cattle industry these next couple of years, and how are you folks at ADM standing by ready to help? Sure. We actually have acquired a lot of different research assets, both in the U.S. and abroad, that actually will bring these natural compounds into the beef industry and help us be proactive in how we uh, support those beef uh, producers, combat some of the stresses that those cattle have, making them more efficient in, in the long term. You know, and as we wind things up here, we've noticed over the past couple of years that ADM has certainly gained the reputation of helping animals with heat stress. What are some strategies that producers can use to mitigate losses from insects or heat stress? And give us a couple examples. Sure, so what we look at is those stresses actually decrease the performance of the animals. So as we are being proactive in applying some of those compounds to the nutrition, we actually can help the animal mitigate that stress and be more productive, either from a gestation, lactation point of view, or from a performance in, in a feed yard. So that's an area that we are strongly encouraging our customers to focus on as we move forward. Well, we appreciate you taking some time Russell. for us here on Cattleman to Cattleman. Thank you, I appreciate it, Russell. All right, again, we've been visiting with Chris Hegedorn with ADM, and for more information about all of their expertise, or of course, all of their great products for the U.S. beef cattle industry, you can visit them online at ADMAnimalNutrition.com. When we return, we'll check in with our good friend, Baxter Black. Stay with us. At Case IH, we believe it's our job to provide you with solutions. That's why our Farmall and Maxim tractors, as well as our tools and attachments, are designed with you in mind. From mowing to baling to loading and more, we're here to help turn your to-dos into to-dones. At Case IH, we'll keep your days running smoothly with equipment that's durable, versatile, and highly efficient. No wonder farmers are more loyal to Case IH than any other brand. Visit your local dealer or go to caseih.com forward slash livestock for more. We know you're up before the dawn because the cattle rise before the sun. And you spend long hours in the saddle because the herd isn't always over the next rise. And you care for the land because you know it takes care of your family. And we know you do great work. And it's time to tell that story to the marketplace. I am I Global is here to help you do just that. At Leachman Cattle, we're committed to building more profitable cattle. As a third generation seed stock producer, our family has been in this business for over 80 years. Today, we have the best technology ever to build more profitable cattle. Our dollar profit index is a leader in the industry to help you balance all the traits that drive your bottom line. Give us a call or go to www.leachman to learn more. I got bucked off the other day. Alas, it was nothing new. I was sitting on a borrowed horse. The rope was old, the bruise is blue. Thank goodness everyone was there. They never miss a branding. The geezers come to just help out, but nothing too demanding. They mostly come to catch firsthand some wreck or temper riling. I guess I really made their day. I saw they all were smiling. See, I doubled hocked the heifer calf and started for the flankers. But they were backed up, left no time to toss out any anchors. My dally slipped. <laughs> she took the slack and started to ski daddle. The rope flipped up across my waist and slicked me off the saddle, just like I'd rode beneath a tree. I lift and rolled and bounced back up like everything was fine. The geezers gathered round and asked, hurt? No, I lied, it doesn't. It, they seemed so disappointed. It was like they were hurt, I wasn't. But they'd make do. You see, the seed of the story was planted, and for weeks my rep would be discussed with nary a mercy granted, yes, history was set on course. No doubt to be rewritten each time a geezer told the tale. And in truth, it's only fitting. Cause that's how Pecos Bill was born. And Wyatt Earp and others, like Pancho Villa, Sittin' Bull, Will Pickett and his brothers, Charles Goodnight, Casey Tibbs, we bid Vaya con Dios. All legends 
in our cowboy world, we honor now as heroes. So my mishap could be the start of my own legacy, that years from now, we'll see great marble statues carved of me, my picture framed and hung on walls, my likeness carved in leather. My name will be a household word wherever cowboys gather. But in the meantime, I must bear the taunts and jibes that linger of when I bucked off some kid's horse and broke my little finger. This is Baxter Black <laughs> from out there. How's your production on pasture? Our profits down? Our weight gains down? What are you going to do about it? Do something cost effective. Do something that will make a difference. To add the first and proven leader in feed through horn fly control to your cattle rations, ask for it by name, Altacid IGR. Welcome back. The recent cattle industry convention in San Antonio had something for everybody in the beef business. That includes an incredible trade show that covered seven acres. It takes a lot of energy to see all those exhibitors, but Brian Baxter tells us how McDonald's helped fuel convention goers as they walk the trade show floor. One spot in San Antonio where a crowd was guaranteed was alongside the Golden Arches where McDonald's was giving cattle convention attendees free fresh beef quarter pounders. McDonald's, we don't have a product without uh, U.S. farmers and ranchers. And uh, so this is just a, it's a tasty way we can say thank you uh, for all that farmers and ranchers do to produce the high quality beef our business depends on and our customers love and enjoy. So. Uh, we've got the, our, our Mick rig, they call, they call it, because it's not just a food truck, it is a full semi-trailer. And we're serving uh, hot off the grill, fresh beef quarter pounders for free, along with our world famous fries, uh, to anybody from the NCBA convention who wants to come out and, and grab one. So we're happy to be here. We're hoping to give away as many as we can. This is the first time we've actually uh, had the, uh, done the fresh beef on the, on the food truck. So we're pretty proud to have that happen at the NCBA convention. In two days at the cattle industry convention, McDonald's handed out more than 3,000 quarter pounders. These are the fresh, never frozen beef burgers McDonald's introduced in 2018. Since then, sales have climbed. Our customers are loving the hot off the grill fresh beef quarter pounders. And uh, as you can see for all around me here, the folks in the background uh, enjoying the line. I'm real proud, happy to see that line there, and we're working to get them served as fast as they can, but that shows that word's getting out that it's out here, and, uh, and I hope that everybody who's getting to partake in the, the, the truck today is, uh, uh, is appreciating uh, and enjoying that hot off the grill fresh beef quarter pounders. McDonald's sells hundreds of millions of pounds of beef each year, and they have a strong partnership with NCBA, serving as one of the sponsors of the Environmental Stewardship Awards program. Working with NCBA uh, and all the programs that they've got to support uh, American farmers and ranchers is, is crucial for our business. In addition, the chain works in the area of sustainability and shares their knowledge of what consumers want today. Our customers care more and more about where their food comes from and how it's produced. At McDonald's, we are a, a proud burger company and we're committed to using our scale for good. And so sustainability through, our, through using our scale for good is woven into all of our business strategies in terms of how we operate our restaurants and how we work with our supply chain as well. And so, you know, livestock plays a really crucial element to that. And we're looking more and more to understand you know, as we make commitments on climate change, how do we do that? How do we show improvements for our customers and our stakeholders and our shareholders on climate change? and the important role that beef plays uh, in terms of taking care of the land, in terms of storing carbon in soils, and in terms of efficiently upcycling protein and creating a, a nutrient-dense product for our customers as well. And judging by the line, a product that continues to have plenty of fans. Waiting for one more fresh beef quarter pounder, I'm Brian Baxter for NCBA's Cattleman to Cattleman. We're wrapping up this week's show with legacy photos. 
These are great shots submitted by our viewers of daily life on their own farm and ranch. Let's take a look. Want to see your photo on Cattleman to Cattleman? Message them to us on the Cattleman to Cattleman Facebook page or email them to c2c at beef.org. Well, that wraps up this edition of NCBA's Cattleman to Cattleman. Thanks so much for spending time with us. We'll see you again next week right here on RFD TV.